Well, welcome everyone to this session. Fantastic to have you with us today uh, in this first set of sessions here at Innovate 2021. Uh, my name is Jeff. I'm a senior consultant and EMEA business leader here at Sarazen. I've been at Sarazen for coming up five and a half years. Um, altogether, about 12 years experience in IT service management. Um, I guess like a lot of us, I started my career on a help desk, answering the phone, um, triaging requests, um, and done a number of roles since then. Um, and now I'm at Cyrus and I work with uh, organizations all over UK and Europe and um, around the globe, helping them with their ITSM practice um, and service management. Um, on a personal note, I'm based in Southampton, uh, the south of the UK. I live with my wife and two young kids. Not too, not that young anymore, they're getting older, um, six and eight. So certainly keep me on my toes. Um, and to uh, you know, get away from here, get out of the office, get away from the family. I do enjoy walking, um, particularly the last year, I've been doing quite a bit of that. All right, quick housekeeping slide. Um, once again, welcome to the conference. It really is fantastic to have you with us. Um, all the sessions today are being recorded. So if you can't make the whole of this session, then don't worry. And any, any other session on the um, agenda today that you like to look up but can't make, then not a problem. Everything's being recorded. So you'll be able to check those out later on. Um, and we do have live Q&A sessions after each session in the lounge. So you can follow the uh, menu there to get to the lounges. And you'll see for each session today, there is a Q&A session immediately following um, in the lounge for you to check out. And also speaking of lounges, there is a open floor lounge that's open all day long. So you can drop in anytime you like to uh, chat to somebody from Sarah's and ask anything, uh, talk about whatever you want, that's there for you as well. Okay, so today's session, we're here to look at, you know, the difficulties with CMDB and automation, how working on these two things together can actually be easier than, than separating them. Um, we've got a few slides with some kind of theory and some examples, and then we're going to get into a demo where we can look at actually how this can work in the real world. And nobody leaves a Jeff Ross session empty handed. I've got some free code giveaways for you as well. So you can play with this in your own environment and maybe even take it into production. All right. so. Why should I care about CMDB and automation? Now, I think I think we all know why we think we should care. Um, you know, it's on our to-do list. We talk about it all the time. You know, every conversation I'm in, CMDB or automation, or most often both, you know, comes up somewhere. Um, but you know, why is that? It's, it's not just another buzzword. It's not just another thing on our list. We know the return on investment is there um, if we can get there. Um, it's clear that our organization will care about those outcomes. Um, and it's very important to us to, you know, speed up requests, manage that perception of IT. Um, and, you know, and you just don't care about complexity. They're not interested in process and what's going on. They just need what they need and they want it immediately. And we know what that's like. And we've got to find a way to serve that better. So we know we know the reasons why. It's just a case of like, you know, can it be done? Is it possible? How do I how do I get there? Um, and where do I start? It seems like a you know a high mountain to climb. So we've got these two things. Seem to be an automation. We know there's that there's that value to be had. But where do we start? Which one do we do first? Well, as the title of the session says, 
the answer is yes. We've got to do them both at the same time. And that's because doing one without the other is most likely to fail. It's going to be a lot of hard work, that's for sure, a very complex uh, implementation. And it's going to be very, very hard to sustain and maintain that. But they can drive each other. They can work with each other and support each other. So you've got to do them both at the same time. That's how you're going to succeed, by building them up together at the same rate. So why is it so hard? What's our CMDB nightmare? And what I always hear is, it's always out of date. You know, we're changing stuff all the time. People are creating things, removing things, adding things, um, uh, tweaking things. People are moving an awful lot as well. We're going to look at this example throughout uh, our slides and demo today of file shares, something that people always need access to data. And I've used that generic term file shares because you know today that means so much. We store our data across platforms. Um, you know we've got traditional, you know, file servers and and map drives and UNC paths, but we've also got you know online technology, SharePoint, OneDrive, Dropbox. You know data's all over the place, um, and we're storing that data in lots of different places. And as I say, we're not communicating. We're creating those new data shares, those new file shares. We're not communicating that properly. That information lives inside people's brains quite often. And we get these pockets of tribal knowledge. Um, you know, department to department, but, each, but also just person to person. We're not properly sharing that information. We get this word of mouth process. Um, and then the approval process around that just becomes very, very complicated as well. Um, who approves what? and how, whilst people are moving around an awful lot at the moment, also is very, very hard. So there seem to be, it's always out of date, and that's a nightmare. And why is automation hard? What's our automation nightmare? Well, it's that real life is just too complex. You know, we get these lovely automation examples. I, I, I read articles or, you know, watch videos. We've got this end-to-end -end process and it's so slick. But you know the real world is is quite complicated. You know even in small and simple environments, um, things can get very messy very quickly. Let's stick with our file share example. You know we're going to try and automate some approval and fulfilment process around file shares. You know we've got to have our users request that. How are we going to even do that? We can't have them, you know, have a free text input for that for that request. Um, they could type anything, and more often than not, it's you know S drive, which means nothing to us. Um, and then even if we have them select from some kind of list of, of, of file share, then you know our, our automation to kind of pull out and and um, capture the approver for that, and and maybe the AD group to have, provide that access. You know we're gonna have these if else statements just ongoing, ongoing. Um, and it's going to get very long, very complex, very quickly. And every time anything changes, we're going to have to come back to this and re-engineer it and tweak it and change it. And it's going to be so hard to maintain and get longer and longer. And that's a nightmare. So we've got these two problems. We've got CMDB that needs maintaining, and that's so difficult. And we've got automation that needs sort of data behind it to drive it. So we don't have to put all that logic into our automation itself. And that's that's our second problem. So CNDB needs maintaining and automation needs data. And we've got that classic phrase, you know, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. Well, today I bring you two problems, but they're each other's solution. So CNDB needs maintaining. We can solve that. With automation, we can automate the maintenance of our CMDB. And automation needs data. Well, we store our data in a CMDB that can be used to drive our automation. So you see, they feed each other, they drive each other. We've got this uh, idea of going round and round, where the automation drives the CMDB, and the CMDB in turn drives the automation.
what does that look like? Maybe in our, in our real world. Um, well, again, let's stick with our example of, of, of file shares. You know, these are resources that exist in our environment. They are items that we configure and we need to manage that configuration. So what better place to store that than our CMDB? Certainly a lot better than people's brains spread across our entire organization. And I, it's probably better than, you know, an Excel spreadsheet or a SharePoint list, or whatever you might have to store that information. It's, it's CMDB, it's configuration management. You know, in the context of our file shares, what kind of stuff are we needing to store around that? You know, the full list of file shares, a single, a single list, a single complete list of file shares, whether they be across any of those different technologies. Which of these need approval? Which of these can be just available, kind of public? Which of these needs some sort of approval process some authorization to gain access? Who, who can approve that? How does that work? Um, is that a simple process or is it more likely to be quite a complex approval process where you know it's one person and if they say yes, it has to go to somebody else for a final approval? Or maybe there's a list of people and any one of them can, can grant that access. And how do we actually grant that access as well? How do we actually do that? How do we actually fulfill that request once it's been approved? All that information is configuration of a file share and we can store that in a CMDB. So what we're talking about here is a CMDB that's more than just devices and it's resources as well. If you've got Service Manager installed in your environment, you've likely got a CMDB, um, but it may well just be, you know, users and devices, uh, fairly basic. That's what you get, you know, out of the box when you set up Service Manager. And that's great, but really this value is going to come when we move beyond devices and think about resources as seen to be items as well. And then what we can do is we can use that data to drive our automation. We store that data in that CMDB, we maintain it so it's always accurate, and that automated process just becomes so much simpler. We can use that to drive our self-service where users pick their requested file share from that list, that maintained and always accurate list, they're picking directly from our CMDB, possibly with, with a filter, of course. We might not want to give them, a, give them the option to select anything. And then that automation just becomes so much simpler because we can pluck those bits of information we need to automate from that CMDB as properties of the file share. And I know what you're thinking. I can, I can hear it almost. Um, I can hear you shouting at your screens during this presentation. You know, how do we maintain that? We add file shares all the time. We're a large organization here, different departments updating different things. You know, we've got people moving around um, so frequently and uh, people who have to approve things is changing all the time. How do we maintain that? How do we keep that up to date? The answer is automation. And if we automate all the processes around file shares, you know, such as the creation of a new file share or that change of file share owner or prover, then the automation can make the change in the environment and update the CMDB so that our, our real world environment is always reflected exactly in the CMDB and they always align because that's the only thing that's making those changes. And then we win. <laughs> but the question is, what do I win? And that's a fair question. Um, and it reminds me, um, as I said, I've got, got young, young children. And um, I used to be able to, you know, offer the incentive of being a winner. And that was enough to make them do something. So, for example, I'd say, you know, who can get their shoes on first and be the winner? And that was... Um, you know, that was enough to make them rush, rush the front door, get their shoes on and uh, try and get to school on time. And, and that was great. But they're getting a bit older now. They're getting a bit wiser. Um, so now I, get, and now I get asked, what did I win, Daddy? Uh, what's my prize? Um, you know, what do I win? Just, just being a winner is not enough. So what do we win? Well, we know what those, um, 
value, you know, what that value to gain was. It's that time saving from those requests. So think about how many requests you get per month for access to, to data, access to file shares in whatever form that might be. Um, also consider that how many requests there might be that you're not getting because the complex, the, the process is so complex or takes so long, it's so messy that actually your business is sort of working around you and finding ways around it. You know, how many people are maybe sharing their password so that their colleague can access data that they haven't officially got access to and rather than request it, they just share passwords. Or how many times are they, you know, asking a colleague to email them a file um, rather than gaining access to the correct place where that where that file is, is supposed to be saved? So how many are you getting? Plus possibly how many are you not getting? And then we just multiply that um, for the time per request. I'll come with 30 minutes here to, to for my example here. Obviously, that's going to vary from environment to environment. Uh, different organizations will work differently, but I don't think it's you know too unreasonable. I think by the time you factor in the, the end user who may well be waiting for that request and may be less productive whilst they're waiting, depending on you know the nature of the task. We've got the, the, uh, the service desk analyst who's got to take that request and triage it and work it. We've got this kind of crazy scenario where they have to sort of run around and and maybe go back to the user or ask a colleague, you know, what what do they mean by the S drive? You know, where is what are they where is the actual data they're talking about? Um, I, I don't know what I don't know where the financial data is stored. I've got to go and like, investigate that and find that out and and ask. Um, and then you know, and who approves that? Anyone know who approves the S drive? Um, those sorts of things. And and they've got even harder, obviously, as well in in the last year when we can't just turn the person next to us and ask them if they know. We've got to now you know, send an email or have a Teams meeting or whatever that is to to kind of make that happen. So I think 30 minutes um, is about right per request. And so if you're doing 100 a month, then, you know, that's 50 hours a month you're spending on that. Um, and that comes to about 600 hours per year. And that's a third of a person. That's one third of your year that you're doing, just managing that one type of request, just file shares. So what do you win? I think the, the wins can be big if you can solve this. All right, we're going to get into the demo now. So um, we'll look at how, again, we can actually do this in the real world. Hopefully some of my examples will start to make a bit more sense as we get into this and see it happen. Um, I said at the start of the session that we've got some code giveaways. So I've got a link here um, for you to write down. Um, and I will uh, post this again in the uh, in the lounge when we get there. So um, you can see it there as well. Um, but this is the link to the GitHub repo where we've got all of the, uh, the files from this demo. So you can um, download and have a play yourself. All right, so here we are at my portal. I'm going to go and log in. And what I've tried to create here, because of this, you know, the theme here is that automation is hard, seem to be as hard. Um, I've tried to create some content that is um, actually useful to you. You know, what I've, what I've provided in that uh, in that link for you to download, I really think will be useful for you. And that's um, that's because it's what I've built for the demo and to give away something that's generic. It can work across any type of request. The example we've got, uh, I say in this example, is is, uh, is file shares. But I don't want to build something around file shares um, because that may not be interesting to you. That may not be your biggest uh, problem. Um, and you may have, obviously, even if it is, you may have other ones as well. So I've tried to make something, a concept here that's um, that can work for any request. So what I've created is this idea of a requestable item in our CMDB. It's a CI that represents anything that somebody might need to request. 
uh, and helps us sort of manage the the data around how that is requested, how that is approved, and how that is deployed. Um, so let's have a look at that. So under configuration items, I've got all requestable items. And we've got a few examples in here uh, to kick us off. Um, and you can see that some of the types of things I've got here that uh, I'm suggesting people can request. Um, focusing on file shares, uh, I've got a couple of types. I've got SharePoint libraries, I've got network drives. Um, you may have other, other types of file share that you want to, to manage. But again, this should manage any uh, anything that can be requested. That could be include hardware, um, that could include access to business systems, um, mailboxes, whatever it might be. Anything that people request, we can use this kind of framework to manage that. Let's take a look at one of these things and look at sales data. So here's our sales data requestable item. Uh, and it's the kind of information around that um, data store that we need to, to track the, as I say, the approval and the fulfillment of it. We've got a name. This, this would be our, you know, our business facing, you know, friendly name. So whatever the business refers to it as, we want to track that. That's going to help them select it. So if they call it S Drive, we want to put S Drive in here. Maybe not just that, um, but we want to try and help people find the right thing when they select this. Um, we do have the option of an associated configuration item. So that's, you may well have, this is a generic concept, as I said. You may want to take this further. You may well already have um, CIs for things that can be requested. You know, we know that uh, you might well have things for devices and hardware. You may well have uh, CIs for sort of systems, business services, we call those, that you may want to drive that's got a lot more metadata behind it. So you can relate these two uh, other CIs to, um, to kind of make the relationship. This can just be the front of it from the requestable item point of view, dealing with the request. A good idea of an AD group that would grant that access. So how do we actually get access to the sales data? Well, by being a member of that AD group, the sales data SharePoint group, that would grant access to that data. So that's how we can actually fulfill a request to this. To this. We've got a type drop down, like all drop downs in Sales Manager, you could play with this. Um, some more examples in here of different things that you may want to use this for applications, file shares, hardware, shared mailboxes, another big one people are always requesting access to, system access, you can see there. And I've broken file shares, I say, file shares, the generic term, it can represent data anywhere in any, any technology. Also got a status, I've kept it really simple, available, no longer available. There may be more statuses you could track, but it's some way just to track, you know, can this be requested? Um, we want to be able to sort of stop people requesting things when we don't, when we want to turn it off as such, decommission it so we can flip it to no longer available and that will uh, remove it from the view where it can be requested. Um, so we can just use that to control what does and doesn't show up for end users to select. Under our approval section, we've got um, the data of how this thing is approved. So we've got the option for a two-stage approval, a first approver and a second approver with uh, values such as these. So obviously we've got option of none. Some things require no approval and they may well only have one level. So the second approver could be none in a lot of cases. You, but it's possible though, you could have items that are none and none uh, in both both uh, stages because you may have stuff which just, you know, if there's like a social club share or something like that, that just anybody can access, they can just request it and uh, and get access to it immediately without approval. So that's a, a possible scenario. More likely you're gonna have something along these lines, you know, line manager, direct line manager, business unit manager, where it's kind of somebody up the chain, but at a certain point, 
Um, IT procurement, if it's some kind of any sort of IT request, particularly around hardware, you may want IT procurement to actually approve that that request. And then our uh, final option here is named approvers. So in this example, I've got line manager first and named approvers second. And then I can actually list those named approvers, the people that are responsible for this data in some way. So sum up, if somebody requests access to the sales data, then it first needs to be approved by their line manager. And then if they approve it, then we want it to go to these two people who are responsible for that data. And um, one of these two will need to approve it in the example we've got here today. So one, only one of these two will need to, to approve it to provide that access. And we can easily maintain any of this data in the CMDB. So we can manage it, we can update it, we can add new approvers, we can remove them as people move around. And on the second tab, I just want to show you as well, we've got a list of the users who have been given this access or requestable item in any way, whatever that might represent, they've been given it. So we can actually use this uh, to track who, who's got it. This is obviously useful just to, to view and see um, outside of, of you know, another system as part of our CNDB data. This idea of having all the information around this, uh, this sales data file share in one place. But it could also be used to drive, be, it could also be used to drive another process, another request, uh, particularly if there's like a uh, remove access um, request we might want to, to do, we would drive that with the through this data, the users that currently have the access. At the moment, nobody, as you see, has access to that. Okay, so as I said, this idea, this requestable item is designed to be very generic, very universal uh, and used uh, uh, in many different ways. But what we can then do around this is build maybe a more generic request offering. So that's what we've, we've that's what I've got here in, in my environment. I've got a, uh, a request offering where an end user can select a um, a file share. So that's limited. That request offering is showing the um, ask them to select a requestable item from the CMDB, but it's filtering to show them only the file shares. So either SharePoint library or network drive, and obviously only the ones that are available. So it won't show ones that have been you know, decommissioned or turned off, or maybe we just don't want to take exclude from this process because it's you know very confidential or something like that. So the request offering is very specific, even though the data behind it is generic. Um, and then we can build our exact kind of flow and our process uh, around um, around file shares to be more generic. But the back end stuff, the classes, the structure, the automation is all designed to be generic to make things easy for us. OK, so in a minute, we're going to log in as an end user and, and fulfill that request. Um, I just want to um, quickly demonstrate um, that that. So I'm going to use a user called Claire. And I wanted to demonstrate that that user Claire is currently not a member of any group, well, only domain users, not a member of that sales data group. So if this demo works, then we'll see that change um, in a moment. OK, let's get logged on as Claire and, and make that request. So. OK, here we are as our end user. Uh, and we're going to go and fulfill our request for data with our access file share request offering. This is the one we've built around that CMDB data. I've built a very simple request offering here um, just to you know focus on the the points of this of this session. Uh, you may well have more questions to ask, um, more information to gather. We know the point of a request offering is to gather everything we need at this point of entry um, from the end user to avoid having to go back to them at any point during the process. This is a fully automated process, so we, we don't want to have to go back at all. Um, that's going to sort of defeat the point. Um, 
so yeah, it's, it's very simple, but I do think um, that this is actually not that, it's not, not overly simple. Uh, this is everything we need to ask them in order to, uh, to capture this request. It's what do you need access to? And then, you know, to aid that approval process, we are asking for a business case as well. So, you know, what do you need it and why? Everything else about it, we know from our CMDB. We know who they are, they've logged into it. We know who their line manager is. That's tracked through Active Directory and, and brought into our CMDB. We know that when they select something, we know who has to approve it, because that's in our CMDB. Um, and we know how to grant it, because that's also in our CMDB. So everything that we need to know to fulfill this request can be, can be captured from just these two prompts here. What do you need and why? So let's stick with the sales data. They're going to select that. And uh, in a business case, um, uh, you know, we can all dream, can't we, um, of going to a sales summit in Mexico one day. Um, so ready to submit. OK, that's made a uh, service request, SR2700. Let's, um, we can have a click on it, see how that looks from an end user. So we can see it's a request for access to the sales data. Um, and we can see we've got our stages here um, with approval and implement to, to come. So the end user can, will be able to track that through with what we've got here and um, seeing that come through. What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to hop back and logged in as myself and see if we can, if I, what I do is I'll take that link. And have a look at it with my analyst access where I can see the full ins and outs of that request because I want to show you the activities. And um, we've got a, a um, first activity here is a, is a automated activity. It's actually running a PowerShell script using Sarazen's PowerShell activity to set up the approvals. Uh, you can see it's actually already done the first one. It's still running in the background to the second one. And then finally, we have a, uh, another PowerShell activity to implement that request as well. I've got. And let me refresh it one more time and hopefully explain this slightly better. So now we'll have finished processing that. Yeah, so I've got this uh, container activity for the approval stage, uh, a sequential activity, and that contains the two review activities. Um, so it's kind of just, it's a sequential activity within a sequence, so not really doing much in terms of changing the flow. But what it is doing is just this sort of container for the whole approval process. Um, it's um, it's the way that we can um, see that as a single um, step in our flow. See our flow flow goes through waiting, approval, implement, and complete, and it represents one stage of approval. Because the end users don't necessarily care about what's inside that box. You know, they just want access to it. Uh, that's for IT to worry about. Um, it also helps with the automation, having that container, that approval stage. It allows us to dynamically insert these review uh, activities in the correct place in our flow, rather than to try and get them in to the right place within a single uh, sequential flow, you know, which, which would be, you know, somewhere in the middle of it. By having the container, we can just insert them into that. And it just makes that process a little bit easier for us when we um, create that automation. So we've got our flow built out already. So we, what we didn't see, uh, I'll show you behind the scenes uh, at the end, is we didn't see the kind of completely empty shell. When this request first landed, this would have been empty. And both these review activities have been created dynamically on the fly um, based on our data. If we jump into one of these, uh, here's our first review activity. And you can see now we've, the uh, workflow is caught up and put this one to in progress. 
this one is assigned to Melissa. That is the line manager of Claire. Um, just have a quick look. There we are. So it's gone to uh, the line manager for the first approval. That's what we said it should happen from the sales data requestable item. And we've got a second review activity. No, this one is still pending. And that's gone to those two individuals, Sean and Michael. They were those approvers set on that requestable item as the owners of that, uh, of that system. Um, and it's got all that information. It's pulled it from the fact that the SR has the sales data as a relatable, as a related item, as a CI. And it's the automation has reached into that object, pulled out the fact that it's line manager, pulled out the fact that the affected user is Claire, looked up Claire's line manager, created a review activity for that line manager, Melissa. It's then seen as a second approval for those two individuals, Sean and Michael, and it's gone and created a second review activity for them. So it's done all that just by reading from our CI, by reading from our CMDB. The automation, sorry, the CMDB has driven the automation. Okay, and um, let's say that second one is still pending because until the first one is approved, the second one won't go into progress. So it's the first approver only and, and only if it's approved, the second approvers need to do anything. Let's go and get these approved. So I'm going to go and log in as a Melissa now. And we should see there's approval waiting for Melissa. Yep, there it is. Please review the sales data SharePoint library request. And of course, Melissa would approve. Okay, so that's been approved. And we will obviously need to wait a few moments for the workflow to catch up, but what that's gonna do is complete this first review activity and then put our next one into in progress, ready for either Sean or Michael to also approve. And, you know, in your environment, you're going to have, I'm sure, some kind of uh, notification around this. Can't expect uh, managers and, and um, uh, you know, people in the business to be logging in to our portal every minute to check for something needs approving. We'll need some kind of uh, notification. Um, we can do that through um, maybe Teams, uh, maybe through email, it's possible. And we have technology nowadays where we can approve these requests, you know, right where within those platforms, within Teams, um, through email, using interactive cards. We don't have to have our business users come into our portal to approve these things. Um, we want to, again, make this whole process as kind of seamless and slick for our business users as we want. Um, in this demo, I'm going to stick with the portal though. I'm going to go ahead and log in as Sean. And um, with a bit of luck, his approval's waiting for him. Not yet. Let's see how we get on with this uh, workflow. There's a few steps here. We have to, oh, we should be there by now, look, according to this. It's in progress. Let's give it another refresh over here. There we are. Must have just, just happened as I spoke. There's a few steps need to happen between those two uh, that when we're out of the demo, we don't really notice. Let's get it approved from Sean as well. Okay, so that should be done as well. And then jumping back, that should complete the second RA. That will complete the whole uh, approval stage sequential activity because everything inside it's complete. And that will allow the workflow to move on to the next activity in the overall flow, which is the implement request partial activity. What that's going to do is, um, again, driven from the data in this request. So again, it's going to, based on how this in this SR, it's going to look up again the 
related CI, that's sales data. It's going to look inside that and know that the AD group at that, uh, you know, to grant access is the one that's recorded there. It again also can look up the affected user of this request. It knows it's been approved because it's got this far down the flow. We can't get here without approving. So we know it's been approved at this stage. So we can just add that user to that AD group to grant that access. Hopefully gives the workflow engine a couple more moments. Let's see how we're getting on. Oh, look, we're done. We've got ticks across the board here. See that all our activities are uh, complete. Moment of truth, let's have another look at Claire's AD account. And um, we can see that she's now a member of the sales data SharePoint access group. So the permission has been granted. And again, we would need some kind of notification to, to, let, to let her know that's been done. Um, and then maybe some uh, final steps into actually some kind of user guide how to get to that data. Um, but all the technical bits are done, the access is granted. The last thing I want to show you is to come back to that uh, sales data requestable item. Here we are. We'll also see a change here. We should now see that under users, that Claire is also assigned here, related. We made a relationship between the requestable item and the AD object, you know, the AD user object. Um, to show that she's been given that that item. So again, from a CNDB point of view, we can now see everything about this sales data and it's up to date and it's accurate. And that's because the automation has driven the CMDB. The automation itself has made sure that in this scenario, our CMDB is, is up to date and accurate. And as soon as the access was granted, the CMDB reflects it. Nobody needs to do that manually. Uh, there's no process there that could be forgotten or, or fail to happen. The, uh, it's done by the automation. So we've got this perfect alignment between what's actually present in the environment and what the CNDB is telling us. The final um, kind of area I wanted to get into here is just how this can also help um, really with a lot of other processes, um, this idea of keeping our CNDB accurate um, a lot of other pressures around users. And if we want to kind of, we often want to think of things from a kind of user centric point of view, really. Show me everything about that user. Um, so if I search for Claire as a user, and go and look up her CNDB item page, um, you know, as a user object, we can obviously see the user stuff about a user job title and, and, and location and so on, phone number. Um, but we can also track the data around them. We've got the line manager, for example. We've got obviously all their work, uh, all their um, work items that they've raised. That's uh, maybe uh, usual stuff. But we can also see from a CMDB point of view, the assets they own or are related to in any way. Um, so useful when someone leaves to know what what they've got, what hardware they've got. You can see here that uh, Claire's got a laptop and a mobile phone. You know, if she if she's leaving or something like that, we make sure we get those back. If there's any sort of security issue or vulnerability with a particular type of phone, we've got all that tag. We can get all that back. Um, some interesting metric here, we can see that she has also been using another laptop that she's not the owner of, laptop nine. So that might indicate something's, something's going on. Is she is she borrowing one? Has she got a problem with, with this one? Um, so useful information we can see from licenses to consumables. We see all this information from an asset management point of view about this user. Um, once we get inside, we have a rich CMDB where we're relating things up. Over to our requestable items, where we're focusing today. Again, we're now seeing that she's been given access to that sales data. So again, from a, if they're leaving or moving or changing roles, what have they got access to? Do, and does any of that need revoking because they're moving to a different role where it's not appropriate for them to have that anymore? Or do I need to now go and request more, more access because she's moving to a role where 
further access required. I can come and see here from a CMD point of view what they've got. So this data can be then presented up, sliced, um, reports around it, but it's all driven from that CMDB. Um, the final one here is we can see that Claire herself is an approver on the facility share drive. This uh, is very useful. That example we had back in the slides of, but people are always moving around, people are constantly changing. That is very true. And again, particularly this last year, we found our businesses be you know, more fluid than ever before. Um, and if people are moving around, we need to track that. But one we can do that is here with this user-centric view. We can see that Claire is the approver of that data. So she's leaving or moving on or changing roles. We need to make sure that that data has a, a different approver added. So by just seeing things from the user point of view, it can be very powerful as well. And it's all, again, driven from our CDB, which is driven from our automation, which is driven from our CMDB and on and on and on. And I could keep saying that for the rest of the day, but I'm sure you've got other sessions to get to. All right, I did promise um, that we'd have a quick look um, under the, you know, behind the scenes. So in the last few minutes here, um, we'll do that. Um, so I'll show you in the Service Manager console. And this is all included in the, in the giveaway. Um, I want to show you our template. We have our um, sales, uh, sorry, access a file share template, first of all. So this is generic to file share access. Um, we can then assign that to a particular, you know, classification support groups and so on that might need to be aware of this. Here's the interesting bit with the activities. As you say, the bare bones of it is just our two PowerShell activities that take care of the, the two parts of the automation, and then this sort of container in the middle for the approval. And this guy fulfills that, adds the activities all dynamically. Um, if there's only that, you know, if there's only one approver, remember there's that first approver, second approver. If there's only one and then none, then it won't ever create a second. If it's a none, none, it won't create anything in here. And it'll just sail right through this approval stage onto implementation. So that's why it's the idea of dynamic. That's why it's not here in the template, because we don't know at this stage what's going to get selected. Uh, therefore, we don't know how many review activities we need. So they stay out of it. Just our container goes in. And that makes this you know, infinitely uh, future proof as well. We may have we may think, well, today everything does have two stage approval, so we could we could add that in. But in the future, that may not be the case. So this allows for anything uh, going forward. And then that's our template. So secondly, we have the request offering itself. This is the one I've been using. This acts as the file share. So let's have a very quick look at this. Um, so what I want to show you really is uh, we've got our two user prompts. As I kept it very simple. And this prompt here is a um, query results. So that's what I'm looking for. If we look at how it's configured, it's tied to our requestable item class. So we're getting to pick from that actual real data. Um, not having a secondary list that has to be maintained as a separate process. If we add something new to that requestable item, it'll be part of this process immediately. But with a criteria, we're only showing the ones that the type is SharePoint library or network drive. So we're filtering it to those two types of file share and where the status is available. So if we add something else that meets that criteria, it'll show up. If we take one of our Existing ones, if we you know take that sales data and flip it to no longer available, then it won't it'll stop showing up the next time somebody accesses this request offering. So it's all driven from that CMDB. Um, so the data structures are generic, the automation is generic, the request offerings you can make as unique and complex as you need to for that particular process. And the templates obviously as well, you can make unique for those. Uh, processes, but hopefully you can use the 
the class, the requestable item class, the management pack, you know, that that's contained in. And you can use the two automation scripts for access, you know, for approval, sorry, and then for implementation. You can use those for anything. So those are built to be generic to cover any scenario that you might have. All right, that is the end of our session today. Um, I really hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, it really was great to have you all with us um, in this session. Um, if you have questions, that is fantastic, and I really want to hear them. As I say, we have a lounge that's going to be opening up at the end of this session. So join me in that uh, lounge. I would really love to hear any questions. Uh, you've got on what you've been doing with CNDB and automation, how you think this uh, this content might help you, or anything else. So please do find me and ask anything. All right, thanks everyone. Goodbye.